Tonight on KQED Newsroom, President Trump declares a national emergency in response to the coronavirus. We'll hear about what officials are doing to contain the pandemic in the Bay Area. Plus, markets around the globe have taken a hit, prompting fears of a recession. We'll hear how local businesses are faring during this crisis. Also, the elderly population is especially at risk of catching and possibly succumbing to COVID-19, but efforts to protect them through isolation come at a cost. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Lily Jamali, filling in for host Priya David Clemens. The coronavirus has many spooked and concerned. Tonight, we're going to do our level best here at KQED Newsroom to bring you information about how this virus is impacting our health, our economy, and our society in unprecedented ways. Today, President Trump declared a national emergency to access up to $50 billion in disaster relief to help combat the spread of coronavirus. Also this week, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic. More than 130,000 people have been infected in at least 114 countries. In the U.S., federal officials are struggling to contain coronavirus outbreaks as hospitals grapple with a shortage of masks and testing kits. State and local officials are on the front lines of trying to contain a surge in new cases. On Thursday, the California Department of Public Health said gatherings of 250 people or more should be postponed or canceled until the end of March. Joining me now is Dr. Erica Pond, Interim Health Officer for the Alameda County Public Health Department, and KQED Health and Science reporter Laura Clivens. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks. And one of the main takeaways I got from President Trump's national emergency declaration, that press conference that he held today, was this idea of by early next week, we could have about a half a million more testing kits uh, going out around the country. Um, we have 330 million people in the U.S. So, Dr. Pond, starting with you, do you think that's going to make a difference? Uh, I think it will help expand the uh, ability for clinicians to be testing, but I think, uh, and there will be other commercial laboratories hopefully increasing their uh, capabilities as well. And I think we'll continue to need to prioritize those who are at highest risk or the most serious illness for lab testing. And Laura, what were your main takeaways from that press conference? It seemed at times like a pep rally, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, um, in some ways, I think it was uh, one of the more measured things that I think we've seen from Donald. Trump, and I also appreciated some of the Q&A at the end where he was actually calling out collaboration with our governor, Gavin Newsom. That was pretty interesting. Um, but again, there, there's also sort of this tone of um, American exceptionalism um, and sort of uh, placing the blame on uh, other countries and sort of highlighting how wonderful of a response we've seen here when a lot of the uh, response has also been delayed, has been criticized for being delayed. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pond, uh, Alameda County hasn't been as hard hit as, as some of the other counties in the Bay Area. So just bring us up to speed on where we're at right now in terms of the number of cases. Sure. And I might actually back up to talk about uh, early public health department response. We actually activated our department's operational response for monitoring this uh, on January 22nd and, uh, you know, gradually escalated to uh, then there was the state declaration of emergency and I declared a local health emergency on March 1st in Alameda County just because of the workload, even initially, of travelers coming in from China and beginning to monitor them. So we've been actively monitoring the situation and uh, working on a local public health level uh, uh, for eight weeks already uh, actively. And uh, now we have seven cases. Um, as mentioned, we have now just had increased availability for lab testing as well and uh, more access to lab testing. So we anticipated more cases coming this week just as more labs were able to run. And, and, uh, and we also heard from uh, the Oakland Unified School District saying that they are now canceling classes for a couple of weeks following several other districts in the state. Um, first of all, I want to just ask you, do you think that was the right call? So I know these are very difficult decisions that school administrators are making, and uh, these decisions are especially difficult with uh, a lack of hard data. There have been a lot of modeling and talking about flattening the epidemic curve or a pandemic curve, and all that was really done for pandemic influenza. And we are seeing, according to the World Health Organization, a lot of differences between this COVID-19 virus, which is a coronavirus, and the flu virus. And uh, so I do think we all need to continue to weigh the uh, impact of school closures. And the, the CDC just posted a guidance yesterday, March 12th, 
uh, unfortunately, right around the time when there was some concerns about possible uh, children who were in schools with cases that, my understanding, have tested negative, mm -hmm. uh, that caused a little bit of a cascade of Bay Area school districts around the Bay. And again, this is a controversial area, but the guidance that the CDC just posted actually suggests that school closures may not be the most effective, uh, and we should be really focusing and prioritizing the mitigation things that have more impact well, in our you, communities. So, so is your position that you agree with that, that based on the case study that we've already experienced in, in countries in Asia, for example, that this that this won't actually make a difference? Well, again, you know, it's difficult and the, the data is minimal, so I support the difficult decisions that uh, these health, uh, these district officials are making um, along with the potential health impact, the other sort of demands that uh, are being made on their administration. And I think it's a nice time to pause for them to plan for the possibility of longer closures, but I do have concerns that it may not have the added impact that uh, people think it will, and there are some uh, potential downstream impacts such as workforce yeah. uh, impact. Yeah, and there are really widespread impacts from this no doubt. Laura, I want to talk to you about the impact on first responders, because down in San Jose, we're seeing that I think at least four uh, firefighters have been uh, found found to test positive for the coronavirus. So what's the impact they're going to look like, you think? Yeah, well, so in that situation, they also quarantined, the fire, fire department said that they quarantined 77 additional people who work there. Mm. Um, so that is a really big impact. And I think it's something that we all need to be thinking about. It's not just firefighters, but yeah, other first responders and folks whose jobs really involve going out and being in the community. So yeah, it's something we have to think about. Um, and they can't work from home is another concern. Right, absolutely. Um, and then I think it's sort of, you know, and adding to what you were saying about the school closures, a lot of the discussion has been around with, I've talked to other public health folks in different counties is, you know, what is essential? Um, and thinking about that term essential, is it essential mm -hmm. that we close down the schools? And I think we've seen right this cascade happening now and so it seems to be hard to be the odd man out but um but it does really disrupt and take people off the workforce who now have to take care of their own children at home. One of the things you spent a lot of time doing this week uh, is, is calling up hospitals and talking to officials uh, in hospitals across the Bay Area. Where are their concerns right now? What's top of mind for them? Well, a lot of them were concerned about testing kits, you know, still not having enough, even though that number, the amount that we can process a day has is moved into the thousands now here in California um, with the collaboration of public health uh, departments and and private entities and that's that's great to increase that number it's still not enough though um, they're concerned about personal protective equipment um, specifically you know space needs might be an issue uh, but we did see that you, you know potentially will have even hotels be repurposed if need be. Um, and then they also talked about just being really nimble and creative. So some of the, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Pond, I want to ask you, I mean, on that note, do you feel that Alameda County, can you assure residents there that they are, uh, that the county is ready when it comes to the number of beds available, the number of respirators available in case these seven cases really blossom into many more? Sure. Um, we've been working really closely. We have a disaster preparedness health coalition, and we work closely with our hospitals, hospitals and our health care providers. Uh, and I do think everyone needs to be dusting off their pandemic plans and, and working on their surge planning. Uh, different systems are thinking about, uh, as you mentioned, alternate care sites or setting up tents to see some of their outpatients. That also helps decrease the spread of disease as far as seeing potentially infectious people coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I think we are ready. And I think the other thing that's helpful at about these various states of emergencies is we can mobilize through our emergency operations center um, and through our regional and state resources to request resources. Uh, we are hit hard right now in the Bay Area. Um, I think we're going to be an early sort of situation so we can uh, request resources from other parts of the state or the country. So give us a reality check, doctor. How bad do you think this is going to get? So we are definitely in, in, as the World Health Organization said, a pandemic, and I do want everyone to know we've been taking this very seriously. I also want to reassure people that over 85% of people will have mild illness, but what this will do and what our concerns are are that uh, the most vulnerable to this illness, to being hospitalized or even critically ill and the mortality is really related to the elderly and people with underlying health conditions. So all that we can do together as a community um, to stay calm and not to panic, but think about all these planning and preparedness to help protect our most vulnerable.
So with things changing so very quickly on this story, Laura, what advice do you have to the public? I mean, how do we keep up with all of this news? Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, check in on a few trusted, reliable resources uh, from time to time, but don't just consume the fire hose because it's too much. Um, and then also really just take care of one another and, um, and make sure that those vulnerable people are getting taken care of. All right. Dr. Erica Pan and Laura Clivens, it's so good to have both of you here. Thank you. Right, thank you. Wednesday night, President Trump delivered a primetime address to announce a 30-day ban on nearly all travelers from Europe to halt the spread of the coronavirus in the U.S. He also said he would urge Congress to pass a payroll tax cut and seek financial assistance for small business owners and workers affected by the virus. Meanwhile, stock markets rebounded today after suffering their single worst day in over 30 years. Cafes and restaurants in the service industry have been particularly hard hit as tech companies and other employers cancel conferences and mandate working remotely. With me now are Lauren Crabb, the CEO and owner of Andy Town Coffee Roasters, and Jay Cheng, Public Policy Director at the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. And welcome to you both. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks so much for having me. Lauren, Lauren, let's start with you. You've been in business for six years. You have five locations here in the city and 65 employees. How have you been faring this week? It's been very rough, uh, to, to put it lightly. Um, we, we have seen uh, immediate cancellation in all of the catering we were going to be doing uh, for the next month. We've been, our downtown location at 181 Fremont, uh, near the new Transbay Terminal, as seen uh, Wednesday, it was 50% decrease in sales. Today, uh, it's been 70% mm -hmm. decrease in sales at our downtown location. Um, we uh, do a decent amount of uh, business with uh, offices, and our uh, office orders have completely stopped. Um, even our partners at the Academy of Sciences just have to close. So we've we've definitely seen a humongous impact um, just in our business. And you've had to adjust, obviously. What changes have you made to the way that your employees work so far? Um, well, the first thing we did was was implement uh, safety protocols in the cafes to, to um, so that we could continue operating as a business. So we um, uh, are doing everything in to-go cups uh, to, to reduce the amount of handling of customer cups and for here for here cups um, where we moved all the cream and sugar to the barista side so the baristas are the only ones touching it um, we're just trying to keep our community safe in that end um, and then the reacting to the to the drop in sales we've had to uh, cut hours dramatically um, I'm trying really really hard to not have to lay anyone off um, so we've been uh, encouraging people to go on uh, partial unemployment uh, so they can stay employed with us and still get their, their benefits because all of our employees have, have health care and paid time off. So trying to keep them employed, keep their benefits, uh, but still have some sort of safety net uh, with the partial unemployment, um, it's really, really hard. Right. And Jay, you at the Chamber of Commerce, and there's a whole slew of other business groups that have been calling for the city and county of San Francisco to make accommodations for businesses. Walk us through some of those. Yeah, at a certain point last week, we realized that it's no longer enough to encourage residents to visit small businesses now that we're putting social distancing in place. We really need governments to step up and help these small businesses, especially with the issues of cash flow. We have businesses who have 50, 60, 70 percent drop in revenue, and their tax bills are coming due, their payroll taxes are coming due, their license fees are coming due. So we called for really three firm things. One, a deferment of business taxes until later into the year. The second, a deferment of all, a waiver of all fees. So storefront fees, cafe seating fees, sidewalk litter abatement fees, banner and sign fees, uh, to just waive them for small businesses and restaurants. And the third is really to expand unemployment insurance for workers who have cut hours due to the coronavirus. And this is all so that we can help ease the cash flow situation for small businesses to ride out this wave. And the issue of debt is so important for small businesses uh, like yours especially. And we were talking about how the Small Business Administration is offering these low interest loans yeah. to uh, owners like you. How helpful is that? It's a good start. The low interest loans are a good start, but it's not really solving the problem. It's just kind of taking this cash flow emergency that we're having and spreading it out over the next 10 years instead of providing like real tangible relief uh, to, to small business owners right now. Low interest loans, I understand how they seem like a quick fix solution. Um, there are really so many easier ways, meaningful ways that 
governments could relieve the burden on small businesses. For instance, if you just did a one-year waiver of all the fees that storefront businesses or restaurant businesses would have to pay, we'd probably talk about a 4,000 to 5,000 immediate grant to all small businesses in the city without having an application, without having a loan, without having them to carry debt for the future. And so those are the things that the that government should be looking forward to. And Jay, the fact of the matter is that a lot of businesses in this city are very over leveraged already, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've had several years of very cheap debt, right? Interest rates have been at historic lows. And so a lot of small businesses, it's very expensive to do in the city, to do business in the city. They did what made sense, which was they uh, took on debt so that they could hire up and scale to a point of profitability. Now those monthly payments are coming due and their revenues have fallen through the floor. So Lauren, when did this become real for you as a business? Last week, when we have a, a cafe, one of our five locations is inside of a inside of an office, and it became real to me when that office closed, um, and that was immediate. And we got the call, and it's like, you the the office is closed. You guys can't come to can't come to work tomorrow. Um, and that luckily that cafe is really small. It was only a handful of employees, so we were able to move them and and accommodate them. And then when the work from home uh, hit almost every tech company earlier this week, um, our 181 Fremont location, we had moved employees from one area to the other, and then that location just completely uh, saw a 50% immediate reduction, and it's getting worse. Have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, I mean, the closest thing that I've that we've experienced to this uh, would be the fires of 2017 that really affected the air quality here, and and that we saw a, a probably 30 percent drop across the board in in, um, in cafe sales. Yeah. But that's nothing compared to this. Like, mm -hmm. and and the, the there's no end in sight. When the when the rain came and the air cleared, everyone just went back about their normal their normal daily routine, and we're not. We're not going to see that this time. And I think that when we talk about having a black swan moment, this is what a black swan moment means. We have so many large employers who are now shutting down their offices, encouraging their workers to work from home, right? And just like Andy Town Coffee, we have entire restaurants built on the business model of lunch service, lunch service which frankly no longer exists. And even after the crisis resolves and winds down and we get a grapple on it, we don't know what the long standing relationship around consumer behavior will be, yeah. right? whether businesses will just pivot to work from home and whether those restaurants will ever be able to come back. So Jay, have you been able to, in your role at the Chamber of Commerce, have you been able to put numbers to this? What is the impact at a macro level? It's at the very least tens of millions of dollars. You know, part of the issue around putting hard numbers around this is that the scale just widens every day. A week ago, uh, we would have told you, oh yeah, it's about a millions of dollars. We could put a hard number on it. And then we put a ban on large gatherings and the Warriors games got canceled and the Giants games got canceled. And that by itself added a couple million dollars to the economic impact that we immediately saw. So Lauren, what sort of economic relief would help you the most as a small business owner right now? Tax deferment is a great start, um, but I think when we're talking about the service industry and the restaurant industry in particular, um, I would like complete tax relief from, from city taxes right now. I mean, the, uh, uh, the unsecured property tax is coming up. Unsecured property tax, a lot of people don't even know it exists. Yeah, tell us what that is. Um, so unsecured property tax is a tax that the city places on basically anything that, if you flipped your restaurant up upside down, everything that would fall out. So it's your refrigerators, your ovens. Um, for us, it's our coffee roaster. Um, any uh, unsecured property within your building, you have to pay an annual fee on. Restaurants in particular, we have hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment in our restaurants, um, uh, we meaning the restaurant industry, and um, that unsecured property tax is a huge burden every year. And that's coming due, and I think that if the city wanted to make a, an impact specifically on restaurants, that would be a great place to start. Absolutely. If the city uh, did tax relief for just businesses that did $5 million of gross revenue or yeah. below, that would immediately be a $50 million stimulus shot into our local economy. Yeah. right? And then when we talk about the impact on that has on the city budget, um, that is just 5% of the business taxes that we collect on an annual basis, right? Come from these small businesses. You know, the city has things like rainy day funds. I mean, I think this is the definition of what a rainy day is. Mm -hmm. And we haven't talked about bigger picture, you know, things like tech conferences being canceled. You mentioned events. What is your understanding of the impact as it continues to, to sort of snowball? 
I don't think we really ever think about how, what kind of scale these tech conferences are and how much they give to our economy. I mean, we have printing companies at the chamber where 70% of their revenue has disappeared when the Game Developers Conference canceled because all the printing of the brochures, all the printing of the banners, all the printing of the passes. And what's most heartbreaking is that when you're like a printing company, you've ordered that paper a year in advance to have that inventory. So you've spent your $100,000 out on inventory, but now you have no income coming in. So we see that for IT workers and printing companies and event services. All right, well, Lauren and Jay, thank you both for helping walk us through the local impacts of all of this. Lauren Crabb is the CEO of Andy Town Coffee Roasters and Jay Cheng of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for having us. This week, the American Healthcare Association and the National Center for Assisted Living released guidelines on how to protect the elderly from the coronavirus. Among the recommendations, restricting visitors at nursing homes and assisted living facilities. In Washington state, at least 22 people linked to a single nursing home have died from COVID-19. Measures like canceling activities at senior centers can increase the social isolation or depression and anxiety that some seniors already feel. Joining me now is Patrick Arbor. He's the founder and director of the Center for Elderly Suicide Prevention at the Institute on Aging. Welcome to you, Patrick. Thank you. And you have been working for the last several decades on trying to help the elderly avoid social isolation. And you set up something decades ago called the Friendship Line. How does that work? Uh, the Friendship Line was created as a way to mm, reduce loneliness and social isolation, particularly among older people or younger disabled. And what we felt and believed at the time has to do with connections and that what Institute on Aging and I personally as well as professionally believe is that connections to others is what bind us to life. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the goal. And Friendship Line is both a accredited crisis intervention hotline, but it's also a warm line so that older people don't have to be in a suicidal crisis to call us. Yeah, that connection is so important. And we actually have the number up on your screen right now. It's 1-800-971-0016. Patrick, how are you seeing that line being used right now? Well, right now, a lot of people are calling us, so we're getting many more calls. Um, and uh, it's putting a little stress on our resources, uh, which is um, a concern. And uh, what, they're, what they're mostly talking about is their fears, their anxiety. Um, they're worried about what's going to happen to them, particularly those who um, are living alone and don't have um, really any numbers of social uh, interactions that they can count on. So they really depend on us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and we're just noticing just how scared and fearful people are. Is, you know? there, is there a particular call that comes to mind in terms of just offering some insight into how people are reacting to the coronavirus? Well, one that stuck in my mind uh, is uh, from an older woman who is very isolated. And when she hears things about, you know, minimizing, you know, social contact, um, that has made her very upset. Uh, because she said, I cannot bear being in my apartment by myself all day long. I have to get out. I go to the market. I go to a senior center. I go to other uh, places where other people are. And uh, to be told that we have to keep this social distancing thing uh, has really made her mad and, um, and distressed. And she said to me, I don't care if I get the coronavirus. Wow. It is better than being stuck in my apartment by myself. You know, loneliness and social isolation is a very serious concern for people. Right. You know, um, and, and so we feel that kind of energy. So you're seeing some defiance uh, in, in cases like hers. What do you say to someone like that? Well, first of all, what we do is validate their feelings, you know, that, that and especially me being 72, uh, that I can understand what she's saying. Uh, that to be alone, not have other people. And at one point she did in her life, but she doesn't have that now because of death or geographical changes. And uh, so she's, she's mad, and I think she feels very discounted, you know, mm -hmm. that we don't say in our narrative that comes from the media uh, or newspapers, hey, we are paying particular attention to this high-risk group of people who are the older adults. 
So what are you hearing in response to this ca this uh, series of cancellations that we're seeing of activities at places uh, like senior centers and assisted living facilities? See, we talk about economic recession, but we're not talking about social recession. Mm -hmm. And this is a, you know, a real, real concern uh, that the impact of these restrictions are going to have a a negative impact on older people who are already lonely or isolated. And as a senior citizen yourself, how are you doing? Hmm, not so great. Not so great. Uh, and the reason for that is that I really, you know, um, experience what some of these concerns are. I live alone as well. Mm -hmm. And even though I have people in my life, obviously, uh, but to think about, you know, and you know, if I would get the virus and I have an underlying health issue, uh, that worries me. Uh, and to be quarantined in my apartment would be very hard for me. Uh, I am out all the time. I mean, I'm never at home. So that would be difficult. And I share that with older people who live alone. Does it help that you are also watching out for other people, or does that create additional stress for you? It really helps, you know, because service is what I do. Uh, what I'm concerned about, though, is having to move from face-to-face, -face, you know, contact with people uh, to telephone, and I'm a little anxious about that. Mm -hmm. So what can each of us do to support the elderly, uh, senior citizens in our own communities, in our own families? See, I think we have to know who our neighbors are, and I think we have become a very uh, distancing um, society that we don't know who that older person who has lived in the building for 30 years is. You know, we could slip a note under the door and say, if you are feeling isolated, here's a phone number that you can call. Uh, we could say to somebody in the grocery store who looks like they are, you know, uh, lonely or isolated, we could just say hello to them and, um, and, and allow a conversation to happen. I think what we have done on you know, unfortunately, is to have, again, distance from older people uh, due to ageism and, you know, other, other issues um, that we just don't connect anymore. And that worries me significantly. All right. So pick up the phone, say hello, all great advice. Patrick Arbor, thank you. Thank you. And if you're 60 or older or an adult living with a disability, you can reach the Friendship Line at 1-800-971-0016. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org slash kqednewsroom. I'm Lily Dramali. Thanks for joining us, and good night.